<laughs> and we're live. <laughs> love that. I just get so excited to go live on every other Wednesday for our NBC webinar series. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I am here with Abigail Johnston and Amy Parliament, and we have a very exciting presentation today talking about radiation and all things you need to know about scans. But before we get started, Abigail, is there any um, you know, framing you want to do for tonight's conversation or the support that we offer at spreadingbreastcancer.org for the metastatic community? Sure. Thank you, Laura. And thanks to all of you for showing up on our Every Other Wednesday talks about the things that other people may not be talking about, which has been our commitment to this webinar series from the beginning. And tonight I'm super excited that Amy Parliament is here to talk about scans because scans are kind of those things that we both love and hate in the MBC community. We love them because it gives them gives us more information to know what to do, but also we dread them because they are typically the way that, at least at the beginning, we find out if there is progression other than maybe symptoms or something like that. And so um, we have lots of phrasing that goes around this, right? Scanxiety is a word that everybody becomes way, 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 way too familiar with in this MBC experience. But we wanted to bring to you information about not just PET scans, not just bone scans or CT scans, but also all the different things that our doctors have at their fingertips to order when they need more information. And um, so Amy is gonna talk about her experience being a radiology technologist for probably more years than she wants to admit to, um, and just her ability to navigate around uh, what the doctors are saying behind the scenes, what the staff might be saying behind the scenes so that we can get a little bit more of a picture as to how this is going to affect us as patients. Uh, so Amy, with that, I would love to turn it over to you to introduce yourself and jump right in. Hi, welcome to the radiology department of your hospital or your women's center. I wanna just share a little bit of knowledge. The first disclaimer I wanna make is from my own personal experience. I worked in mobile imaging for over 15 years. So worked at a wide variety of facilities. Also worked out of an 18 wheeler that we moved from hospital to hospital. But also I've been a patient since age five years old. I was diagnosed with scoliosis at five. So my journey in the radiology department began at that age. And that's what drove me into medicine because I wanted to be able to interact with other patients. I was diagnosed early stage breast cancer in 2014 after I found my own lump and then late stage metastatic, which is MBC, stage four, terminal in 2019. So I just wanna share my experience from being a technologist, but also from being a patient and things that you can ask. We wanna give you the knowledge so you can advocate for yourself when your nerves are at the highest, because sometimes your technologist might forget that. As we go through the department, in case you're listening to this, we might have be very descriptive so that that way you can get a mental image if you're not able to watch this on video. And if you are, um, we appreciate that too. There'll be slides that Laura will share. Um, as we go through, sometimes I'll share something and it'll trigger something that Abigail has experienced and she'll ask questions and I'll try to answer those questions. Just remember, we're giving you based off of our experience doesn't mean that that's the end all be all. Take everything back to your physician or your medical team and let them help guide you. So we'll get started. Um, for the diagnostic imaging department, you can go to the next slide. There are various modalities or you might hear your doctor say, hey, there's different options for us to use for different imaging. So I'm just gonna break down the various areas in the department. And after I explain what each one of them are, we'll visit each one with a little more detail and tell you the prep and why they do certain things and why certain things are a certain way. So a modality is like a, 
a little mini department within the larger radiology department. Now, a lot of times they'll refer to it as diagnostic imaging because that's essentially what it is. You're going in for some type of imaging test or some type of exam, and they're going to help you get a diagnosis based off of what a trained professional, like a trained doctor to read specific images. They're going to give you what they know and they have to know all parts of the body and they also have to know how each area of radiology works. So the first modality is x-ray. That's just your basic x-ray. It was discovered by William Rinkin that the first x-ray was a hand was of a hand of his wife. Um, and that has various things. There's not a whole lot of prep for that. If you've ever broken a bone or your child has ever had an injury, they've probably had a plain fill radi uh, radiograph. They put a little plate underneath whatever the body part is and they take images with you turning it different ways. Um, for a basic x-ray, the prep would be um, they would ask pregnancy questions anywhere that we're going to be using radiation contrast in the department. And we'll try to tag those as we work through. Then the next part of the department is IR. It's another radio, radiograph producing. There is radiation involved as they make images. That is called interventional radiology. That might be where you had your biopsy for your cancer diagnosis. It's also where they can do drainages, remove blood clots. There's many things they can do. Another area that produces uh, radiation is CT or computed tomography. Then there's mammography, which many of you have had because you've been diagnosed with breast cancer. Then there's nuclear medicine. For nuclear medicine, it's generally where they inject you with a radioisotope and then they use cameras to take images. And then the next modality is ultrasound. Ultrasound does not have any radi radiation in um, obtaining its images. It uses sound waves. And then there's MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, and that is a dedicated exam. And it uses like the hydrogen atoms in your body to produce images. Um, for each modality, there's going to be different screening questions and different preps. Like I said, as we go through this, we are going to discuss those. Next slide. So what's on the screen is a big yellow square with the black little thing. You've probably seen it if you've ever watched the Big Bang Theory on TV. But it's just letting you know, caution, there's x-ray in. If you've ever had an x-ray or you visited the x-ray department, you've probably noticed that there's signs that tell you if you think you are pregnant or might be pregnant to please inform the technologist. This is to make sure that they don't expose your child or your unborn child. They want to make sure that we take all precautions for that. For an x-ray, it's an invisible electromagnetic energy beam that's used to produce images of internal tissues, bones, and organs. And now everything is pretty much on digital imaging, which means it's housed on a computer. Years ago, things were on film. There's different ways that we process that. So now you are probably Actually, you're probably getting a QR code if you're taking images somewhere because we're that far advanced. But most places you get a CD or they'll put the images in your chart so you can have access to them and download them on your computer. For x-ray, generally for a basic x-ray, there's no prep. They will ask you to remove the metal so it doesn't obscure whatever body part they're trying to do. They might ask you to remove your jewelry or your bra. If you have hair clips or pins, if you have a cap on, a zipper, they might ask you to remove that. They will ask you if you are pregnant, if you are of childbearing age. Um, they Recent information shows that shielding is no longer needed. I get asked this question a lot. Many um, people used to get shielded for the little gonadal shielding if it's a boy or they would shield your breast if it was a girl for certain imaging. But research now shows that that's not necessary for the minimal amount of times we get x-rays in our life. Next slide. We're going to move on down to a little bit more dedicated. Next slide. Um, a little more dedicated um, a part of x-ray and it's called fluoroscopy and that's where they can do continuous x-rays and watch it on a screen. Um, fluoro is normally used for like upper GIs, video swallows, a cardiac catheterization, any kind of small bowel exam, barium enemas. 
They can do it for an HCG, which is a hysterosalpingogram. That's for women that are having difficulty and having fertility issues. They can put you on the machine and they'll check to see if your fallopian tubes are open. They can use it for arthrograms or steroid injections. And an arthrogram is a type of imaging of a joint where you've had a joint injury and they're trying to look at like the labrum in your shoulder or they'll look at knee. A lot of times this happens for athletes or younger people when they're trying to decide what type of surgery or what type of injury that they've had. What you'll do is you'll go to the x-ray department, you'll lay on the table that does fluoro, the doctor will I'll clean the area, they'll inject it, and then afterwards you'll go and have a follow-up CT, or and most oftentimes it's an MRI. It gives them dedicated images with contrast in the joint space. For fluoroscopy, a lot of times if you're being injected or they're doing any kind of type of exam that looks at your digestive tract, they're going to ask you to be NPO for four to six hours if it's a baby. They might tell you to hold them and don't feed them from one feeding to the next if they're trying to do a certain type of exam. If it's for interventional, for a biopsy or a drainage, you could possibly be a same day patient where you would have to stay and be monitored after the procedure. Certain types of biopsies, for instance, like a lung biopsy, they generally try to do those earlier in the day and not on a Friday so that that way, if you have any complications because the way the lungs work, they'll do that earlier in the day so they can keep you for several hours and then discharge you home and hope that you have no issues. After you have a lung biopsy, they oftentimes will do a chest x-ray a few hours later just to make sure that both lungs are fully inflated. Um, for fluoro, there are different types of contrast used, and the type of contrast is you, depending upon what body type you are having um, examined. You might hear the term PO, which means oral contrast, so you might see PO written on your script, or your doctor might use those words, or the nurse. Um, with Fluoro, you also still need a pregnancy test. They want to make sure if they're using any type of x-ray because your body part would be within six feet of the beam that you're not pregnant. Um, next slide. On this slide that's up, it's a CR machine, and this is most oftentimes used in the OR or interventional. It allows the doctor to move the piece of equipment up and down the table and look at a specific body part. There's a there's a beam at the top, and then there's like a camera at the bottom, or they can flip it over and they can see imaging. A lot of times they use this type of material for orthopedic surgeries, or if you've had a metaport placed, you might see this used for a biopsy or to insert a pacemaker. They could do it for angiograms, any kind of cardiac cath. Um, we can also use a C-arm, like they might use that type of technique if they need to. There's procedures called cryotherapy or microwave therapy. That's where they either freeze or burn the mass that's there that shouldn't be. Next slide. They would be done, this is part of the interventional. And this here, for the, um, uh, for the interventional, it's a newer like specialty within the last 20, 30 years. They use it a lot more now than they used to. The, um, it, you do angioplasty, embolization, gastric tubes, stent placement. They can remove a foreign body. That means like a needle or something. If you get something in your foot and they need to watch themselves try to remove it, they can do needle biopsies. They can put IVC filters in. That's a vena cava filter if you've had previous blood clots. Um, they can inject you to look to see if you're... Um, if your heart is open, if you're in the cardiac cath lab, they can insert cancer catheters and they can also perform cancer treatments. Those were the ones that I just mentioned that are either like cryo ablation or microwave ablation. You've probably heard of Y90 that's used to treat liver mats. There's so many things that are coming out and you'll see over the coming years, they're going to have more dedicated treatments where they can deploy things straight to the mass and not obliterate the tissue around the area that has the cancer cells. Next slide. We're still in the part of the department where it's producing x-rays or uses some type of x-ray to perform the imaging. 
This is CAT scan. Welcome to CAT scan, com computed tomography, CT, or CAT scan. Go ahead, go ahead, next slide. So for CAT scan, it's a diagnostic procedure that allows your doctor to get information. It You lay on a table and you move through this big uh, circle on the floor. It kind of looks like a giant donut. It's kind of skinny. You can see from one side to the other. And for this, it lays down, it uses x-rays, and it goes to a computer that has um, certain types of software that allows us to see the different tissue densities inside the body. It gives us more detailed images, but in a large quantity. So you can look at bones, muscles, fat, organs, and blood vessels. It can be used as a screening tool for detecting a disease, or it can be used for injuries for various areas of the body. For CAT scan, there's going to be a little more um, intensive prep. If you need to get contrast, they might ask you to be NPO, which means take nothing by mouth. Um, you're going to need blood work if you need to get IV contrast to make sure that your kidneys, um, you're going to need to get um, contrast. Sorry, I was just reading the chat. Um, you can, when you get IV contrast, they need to make sure that your kidneys are going to properly filter that contrast. So sometimes they'll do blood work. It's generally a BUN or creatinine. Um, they will, if you're drinking contrast, they'll have you not have anything. You'll drink contrast. Generally, when you drink contrast, it can be iodine based or it can be barium based. Iodine is the clear stuff you drink that kind of tastes like stale pool water to me. Or you can drink the barium, which is the white chalky stuff. And sometimes they try to flavor it, but I'm not real sure who created those flavors. Definitely not a chef because it doesn't taste good. It's just easier to chug it. But what the contrast that you drink does, it coats your digestive tract and it also allows all the organs to fill in and it gives them like a little defined margin around your pancreas that does a lot of um, work in your body. But then the IV contrast allows them to see if you have something that's taken on, um, if like if it's grown any kind of vasculature, if it's a cancer or there's different types of phases they do. But that contrast, when you get injected, you might have a warm sensation or a sensation down in your nether regions that make you feel warm or like you're peeing. It's because the contrast is a little bit thicker than your blood. And as it works its way through your body, the tissue surrounding the blood vessels are trying to push it to where it needs to be. And oftentimes, I would tell you 99 times out of 100, every woman gets up and they check the table, even though we say you didn't go to the bathroom, but they don't trust us. So um, it definitely makes you feel warm. The warmth that you feel will depend on what type of exam they're doing and how fast they inject you. We, we inject based off of like four mLs per second or three mLs. Sometimes we inject up to six or seven if we're looking at your heart. But the faster we inject you, the warmer you feel. So prep for your CAT scan. Remember, they might ask you to be NPO, which means nothing by mouth. They're going to ask you if you any chance of pregnancy. If you're of childbearing age, they're probably going to do a pregnancy test unless you've had a hysterectomy. They're going to check your kidney functions, the BU and creatinine. And what they do is they use the GFR, which is a filtration rate that tells them if your kidneys are going to do okay with the contrast. Um, and then they're going to start an IV. If you are a hard stick or you have difficulty with an IV, if you have a port, you can have your port used. However, there are some guidelines in certain states. If you have a port and your port needs to be accessed for your test, first key thing, it has to be a power port. They have to be able to verify that it's a power port and it has to have a power port needle in it. What that means is that they can inject your port at a certain rate and they can we can meet the guidelines of the scan. Your port has to be able to flush and some places will not use your port if they can't get blood back. Like sometimes they can flush it, but they can't get blood back. If you live in certain areas or you go to a cancer center or a woman center and they're like, we can't access ports here, ask them, hey, do I need an order from my oncologist for you to access my port? What stops me from getting my port access? Or ask your oncologist, can you go to a facility that can use your port for your scans because if you are a long-term patient you don't want them to keep using the same vein over and over it scars over abigail 
would you like to share here about your port? Abigail does not have a power. Abigail, would you like to? Sure. Yes. I'm so sorry. Was trying to help troubleshoot some of our audio issues. So for those of you who are having any issues, we are working on it. Um, so I have encountered a situation where um, when I was given my ports uh, back in 2017, nobody said, hey, there's a difference between a regular power port or a regular port and a power port. Nobody explained that to me. So I have a non power port. And this is something that I've gone over and over and over again because it has the bumps like a power port has. So some people will be like, oh, I think it is. It's not. But there are some facilities where the contrast is injected by a machine. And if you have a non-power port, the machine can be calibrated to inject the contrast in such a way as it doesn't um, have any consequences for the port. Not every place has this, um, but for me, having basically one vein in one arm that can be used for the contrast and blood drop, peripheral blood draws and all of that, I have tried really hard to maximize the amount of times my port has been used. And so it's worth a question, right? Nobody suggested this to me. It was me keep asking, are you sure there's no way we can do it this way? Are you sure it's no way, there's no way we can do it that way? And uh, was then told that it is possible. But again, that's not gonna be at all facilities. Uh, it's a good question to ask ahead of time if you're preparing for a scan that you haven't had or if you're going to a new facility. Um, typically, the person on the ground that you're talking to, they may not know these answers to these questions. So I would always suggest talking to an office manager at the imaging place that you go, explain the situation. That's usually going to be, you're, you're gonna end up probably with the administrator anyway, if it's kind of outside their wheelhouse. So not a bad idea to check. In my opinion, it has saved me some sticks. Thank you. So for CAT scan, um, and just I want to let you know from my own personal experience, I've had my power port for 10 years. I have to get it flushed every five weeks, but it still works like a champ. I don't like to talk about it a lot because I don't want to like have any issues. Um, so again, just to wrap up CAT scan, CAT scan is an area where you can go in, cover a large, large part of the body like whether it's vasculature or organs or a screening tool. A lot of times for us in the cancer land, we get a chest, abdomen and pelvis CT with oral and IV contrast that lets them see the entire trunk of our body. The prep for the test takes a little bit longer, but the actual scan is generally less than a minute unless they're doing some kind of timing thing. It takes them longer to start our IV for us to drink the contrast than it does to do the um, images. And the one good thing about having this type of scan, it allows them if the doctor sees something and they want them to make the images a little bit thinner or make the images a different way with CAT scan, it takes um, images and slices the body like a loaf of bread, but then it goes into software and they can make images going fr from the front to the back, from the right to the left for 3D images. So there's tons of things that they can do retrospectively to give your doctor more information. Next slide, please. So the next thing in um, the radiology department, which is often in a women's center, they like try to have mammo, bone density, like they try and they normally ha will have an ultrasound machine in like an area to give women privacy as they're doing this type of test. For mammography, it's an x-ray imaging modality used to examine the breast for early detection of cancer and other breast abnormalities. Those are called um, screening mammograms. If you've ever found a lump or you've ever had an abnormal screening mammogram, then they might be giving you, you might go for a different type of mammogram, which is called diagnostic. And with the diagnostic, they use different paddles. They use a little bit different pressure. They might use a little bit different view. They'll try to do mag views where they just look at the area that's suspicious. Um, some women start the screening process due to genetic testing or risk factors. Other women start at the age of 40. That's when it's suggested for you to start the screening process if you have no genetic factors or no physical um, symptoms. For a mammogram, the prep is going to be, they're going to ask you again if you're pregnant. I know all these pregnancy questions. They're going to ask if you're pregnant. They're going to tell you not to wear deodorant because it can skew what they see in the axilla. The axilla is like your underarm. You have lymph nodes there, but the way they pull the breast tissue allows them to see like part of your chest wall 
and to see how like your breast feeds into your underarm. Um, for a mammogram, they need to use a certain amount of pressure. So if you can tolerate the pressure that they use, the, the more they can compress, the better the images are going to be, especially if you have dis, dense breast tissue. They're going to squeeze out the tissue and try to get as much as they can so they don't have shadows. If you have um, something on your nipple or you have moles on your breast, they might ask you to put a skin marker on it so that they know if it shows up on the image that it's the actual skin tag or the mole on the outside. When your mammogram is red, they read it by BIRADS. That's a category that tells them whether it was normal and you can come back in a year or do your next screening. And it goes from zero to five. And those tell like those numbers allow your physician to know if you need to have like a diagnostic mammo, if you need to have short term follow up in three months, six months, if you need to be followed and have like additional imaging or if you need to have a biopsy because there's something highly suspicious. They also just passed regulations in 2024. They now, they're in the process. You have so many months to get this onto the report. Your breast density will now be listed as part of your report or the letter that you get from the Women's Imaging Center to let you know if you have uh, dense breast tissue and how your physician should track or follow you. Most places have 3D screening mammo. Um, hopefully if you are out there and you're getting a mammogram, you are able to get a 3D mammogram. It's a very, very detailed image, um, not an old uh, mammogram that doesn't have 3D. All mammograms or mammography uses a type of AI to help the physician read those images. Um, it's called like in our place, we use like what our vendor is. And I don't want to call out any one vendor because no one's better than the other. It's just whatever your preference is. But that will help the radiologist like draw their eyes to it. It's programmed over time. So it'll also like give an overread and help them with the mammogram. Next slide. One other thing I wanted to point out here, which absolutely floored me after being uh, diagnosed, is that there are those times when the person reading the scan isn't quite sure what it is. So I had a situation where there was something in one of my breasts that they wanted to look at. So this is post MBC diagnosis, post surgery. And the person reading the mammogram, uh, you know, was, was very concerned that there was um, a, a skin mat, that there was a skin mat on my, my uh, screen. And Apparently, his supervisor, a woman, pulled me back in and said, you know, don't be alarmed when you read that particular report. He was he was looking at your nipple. So it was kind of a humorous example. And she said that he was very embarrassed that he saw something and thought it must be something having to do with the metastatic cancer. And no, 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 it was just my nipple. Now, I had nipple sparing surgery, so there was lots of scar tissue there and all of that. So I always throw this into, Amy knows that I always throw this into at least once in our scans presentation, just about how it's subjective to a certain extent. There are some objective guidelines, but there's some subjectivity to it. And so if there's something in a scan that you're not quite sure about, I'm sure Amy will talk about this more, you can always ask to have it be overread, meaning someone else look at it. Um, and in my particular situation, that very nice female radiologist saw the note on the report, knew, she, she double checked, knew probably what it was, and really, you know, kind of got out in front of that uh, concern that that he was uh, that he pointed out on that um, particular report. So just wanted to throw that in there. Sorry if I derailed you, Amy. No, you're fine. So on this next slide, if you're listening to us and not able to watch, it's just um, a couple of images that have women positioned for a mammogram in case somebody's never had a mammogram. There's just photos up so they can kind of see how to stand and be positioned. Um, so. For a mammography, also, if you are being screened, they might ask you like your family history. They might ask you if somebody else in your family has been diagnosed. They what might because um, there's high risk factors. They might ask if you've had pregnancies and not had a baby, if you've never been pregnant. Another question that they often ask when you're doing a mammo or um, an MRI of your breast, they might ask if you're Ashkenazi Jewish, and it's just because there's a higher prevalence in the 
Jewish line that things can turn cancerous. So they're trying to make sure that you're getting the appropriate image. Um, so that's basic mammography. Uh, as Abigail said, the one person that made a mistake for each of these modalities, for re regular x-ray and even CT, doctors often can generally read those exams. But when you get into people that have complicated cases or if they're neuro neuro neurological cases or neuromuscular, there are doctors that are specialized to read in each of these areas. So oftentimes somebody picks that up. So for mammography, a general radiologist wouldn't pick that up. It's generally a dedicated one or two guys or a group of them and they read. And then what they also do just due to the incidence of breast cancer and stuff, they'll overread each other. They'll pick so many cases each month and somebody will look at somebody else's cases. If there's a question that comes up, um, and say radiologist A said one thing and the patient doesn't agree with it, they might have radiologist B overread and either add an addendum or weigh in on what the report says. Next slide. So bone density is often also in the women's like center. And that is uh, uh, often too referred to as a DEXA scan. That test measures the how thick your bones are and if you have like osteopenia or osteoporosis. For us that live post-treatment, post-chemo, some of the drugs affect our bone density. So you might have had um, drugs that boosted your bones or you might take calcium and vitamin D to help you not become osteoporotic. That What that is, is osteoporosis you could fracture your bones very easy, or if you've been diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, you might have bone mats, which means you're at a higher risk for other fractures or other issues. So for the DEXA scan, what you'll do is you'll lay on the machine and they'll like take some images of your lumbar spine. They might do your hip. If you're not able to do that or you've had surgery on either one of those body parts, they'll ask you to stick your arm under the machine and they'll measure your forearm. And what they do is you might have this test every one to two years. They're just watching the density of your bones to make sure that you don't need supplements or some other type of medication to help keep your bones healthy, especially since they're suppressing hormones if you've had a hormone positive um, type of breast cancer. Next slide, nuclear medicine. This is the one where I always get asked, why do I get a bone scan instead of a PET scan? Why do I get a PET scan and not a bone scan? We'll get to that as we work our way through nuclear medicine. Nuclear medicine can do many types of imaging. They inject you with a radioisotope and then they take delayed images depending on the type of exam they do, depends on how much what type of isotope they inject, what the delay is, and what type of test that you are having. For um, this, it, the nuclear isotope goes and it can work off of either like the metabolic activity or it's geared to like bind itself to a certain type of cell or the blood. It can be used, we currently are seeing a lot of use for nuclear medicine for targeted therapies. I mentioned earlier the Y90, which is where they send in the isotope and it goes in and attacks the mass for like a prostate cancer that's been to the liver or to the prostate or whatever. They're doing new therapies. They've learned since they started doing the PSMAs, which is the PET scan that's specific for prostate cancer, they've created drugs for that, it's called Plavicto. That is pretty much just, it's been on the market a little bit, but it's pretty much just um, recently gotten FDA approval. So as they use these targeted therapies for prostate cancer, they're paving the way for them to try therapies for breast cancer and to make um, more progression with how they treat uh, the tissues and the organs so that that way it's targeted. And like I said, they don't damage good tissue around the cancer um, mass. 
For most nuclear medicine studies, you're going to have to be NPO for like a PET scan or a HIDA scan. You don't necessarily have to go without food for a bone scan. But what they would do is if you ate, they'll inject you for the bone scan. They might have you come back in an hour or two. But while you're gone, they're going to tell you to drink extra water. What you're drinking is helping move that isotope around in the body so it gets distributed throughout your entire body. For a PET CT, you can go to the next slide. For a PET CT, um, you need to have a low blood sugar. Most places, their rule is to have it um, under 200. They might also ask you not to exercise heavily the day or two before your scan. They might ask you to follow a low carb diet to ensure that you don't have an elevated blood sugar. Um, the reason they ask you for light activity is to make sure that you don't strain a muscle and then have increased uptake in a muscle that gives you some kind of false reading. When, once you're injected for a PET scan, they often put you in a chair in a quiet, dark room. They don't let your loved one sit with you. They're trying to get you to relax because the more stimulated you are, then you could have increased uptake in your brain or your mouth. If you're talking, you already are going to have some activity because your tongue is constantly moving. You'll see stuff in the bladder or the kidneys, and it's just because of how we filter it, but there should not be an increased uptake. Um, so the reason your doctor might typically do a PET scan, it's going to be the preference of your cancer center. Do they use a PET scan or do they use a bone scan and a uh, a CT. For me, I had lobular cancer, so they often do a bone scan and a pet and a, a bone scan and then a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Um, I've been NED for a while, so right now I'm getting PET scans. But when PET scans first came around, they thought you would only need to have like three PET scans in your life. But as they make advancements with the drugs and the therapies. And as they, as those drugs and therapies work longer for us, that means we live longer, which means we're going to have to be screened longer. Once you go on Medicare or Medicaid, they often limit the number of PET scans you can have in your lifetime. So that's why you may switch from PET scans to bone scans and the chest, abdomen, and pelvis CT. If um, you ever had to have a HIDA scan, that's one that looks at like your gallbladder. What they'll do is have you not have anything to eat or drink. They'll inject you with a radioisotope and then they might give you a fatty meal to see how your gallbladder works after you've been given this fatty meal. It takes, they take images every 10 minutes, every hour, whatever. It just depends on what the protocol is. So um, for nuclear medicine, there's multiple scans, and I'm just going to run down the list of things that you might hear in nuclear medicine. There's renal scans that looks at your kidneys, thyroid scans that looks at the um, thyroid gland in your neck, bone scans, gallium scans, heart scans, brain scans, breast scans. Um, they PET CT is an effective way for identifying a variety of conditions, including cancer, heart disease, and brain disorders. They're also using it now more for prostates. They can do the PSMA prostate scans. If you're listening, you're probably wondering about the Suriana pet. They're trying to make advances with that one. Um, it is being used more, but it's not as widely used as a regular F, uh, FDG F18 pet scan. Um, and the reason is because it's fairly new in the market and has not become the gold standard. If you are on hormone therapy and you're trying to get a Surrey on a PET scan, you will need to be off of certain drugs for so many days to make sure you get an accurate reading. They're also working when I was at San Antonio, which is the breast cancer symposium with a lot of the scientists in December. One of the radiologists shared there that they're working to figure out if lobular cancer with this type of scan, if they need to do a longer delay. So hopefully we'll hear back this coming December that they've made improvements to figure out what the delays are. If you are watching this and you're looking at the screen, um, the middle image is just a typical scanner for um, nuclear department. 
uh, you'll see the PET CT scanner in the middle right. The images above on the right are a PET scan where you see that there's images of the body where they did the CAT scan portion. And then the colored images is where they put the, the PET scan on top of that so they can see where there's uptake in the body, which organs, which bones. In the lower left, that's a bone scan. For bone scans, some oncologists prefer those because they're from the top of your skull all the way down to the tips of your toes, and it covers the entire bony skeletal system of your body. Um, in a PET scan, they generally only scan you from your eyes and to your thighs unless you've had a history of melanoma, and then they'll do a full body uh, PET scan. Hey, Amy, I don't know if it would be a, a good place to talk about this here. So we're, we've got a lot of people asking some questions in the mm -hmm. chat, as you foretold, some of the why pet versus bone plus DT. So I know you're going to get that to that in a minute. But I wonder if now it's, it's time to talk about how when they're interacting all of these tracers, that, that's varying levels of radiation, that's varying levels of something else, right, that our body has to filter out. And so some of those safety things where there's, they start to get concerned about so many PET scans and they want to spread them out, obviously for stability as well. But how, how do, what, what do those conversations sound like kind of behind the scenes in terms of how do, how do they, meaning our medical teams, how do they protect us from things that might happen simply because we've gotten a, a tracer so many times in our lifetime? So it's not so much about the tracer that they worry about because the half-life of that, it's generally most everything's with in, in your system and out of your system within a couple of hours or at least 24 hours. The therapies where they're treating the tumors, that's going to be a little different. So they do regulate when they're putting those radio tracers because they're going to sit somewhere in the system and they're trying to kill off the, the cancer cell. But the and for x-ray, you're exposed to low level radiation just moving about. If you have a basement in your home, there's radon. That's low level radiation sitting next to your computer, holding your phone has EMF. It's very low level when you're getting imaging. What determines what they choose to do is going to basically be what your how your treatment is, how your how you're responding to your specific treatments. For instance, for myself, because I've had stability and I had stability in my early stage, like after the first year, my oncologist chooses to move out my scans. If I have an issue or something happens with my body, I go in, we move the scan up. For somebody that's not had the same type of stability, the frequency of your imaging is going to be more frequent because they don't want the cancer to get away from you and not be able to get ahead of the progression of the disease. So it's all dependent upon there is a thing called like the tumor board review. So if you've had something and they're trying to decide what they're going to do, they hold this thing weekly depends on where, what your facility is. Like somebody from oncology will get on there, like your oncologist maybe, or there might be a radiation oncologist. They might get a radiologist, a surgeon. They'll have different people weigh in. Hey, this patient has this. We've done this imaging. What are your suggestions? Where should we go? And then they get different people to weigh in. It's whether or not your case needs to be presented Generally, the cases that are presented in that manner are complicated cases or cases where they have continuous progression or say one set of imaging didn't see it and another set did. It's going to be what you're, what's considered like the gold standard in your area. It doesn't mean if you don't go to tumor board that you're not getting the therapy that you need. It just means your case is pretty straightforward and it might not need to be discussed. Does that answer that question? Thank you for addressing that. Anything else here? Not here. Keep keep on going. Okay. So real quick, we'll get to ultrasound. You can leave it there. Go ahead. So I'm just going to address as we're moving to ultrasound. A lot of times you guys often ask, why did I get a, a CT and a bone scan and she got a PET scan? For lobular cancer, it's very hard to detect it on any type of imaging. If you have lobular, you already know that. It kind of grows sheet-like. So it's very hard for them to see it. That's why they're doing 
research now to figure out if this Suriana PET CT were, is going to give us more answers in the future. When they decide what they're going to scan, it pretty much decide it's dependent upon how you've progressed. If you've progressed in the bones, you're going to want a bone scan to see if it's anywhere in the bones. If you've progressed in the bones and organs, they might want to do a PET CT because they can scan you in CT where they can see the bones and then they can also see the isotope mask over. You could have progression in your liver and they still do a chest, abdomen, pelvis, CAT scan, and then they do a bone scan. But then oftentimes they'll follow it up and then do a dedicated MRI. There's so many options and variables for how they can image you. It's going to depend on how stable you are as to what your physician chooses. And if you have questions, you should take those to your specific medical team. If you don't feel comfortable or your gut tells you that you're not getting the, re the, the correct information, there is always the option for a second opinion. It's there. You got to do your research. If you don't feel like you're getting the care you need, second opinion. So ultrasound is sound waves. We'll just briefly stop here. A lot of times with ultrasound, you can go to the next slide. They use pro what they call probes. Those are the things that create the images. On the slide that we're currently showing on the machine, we just have a machine and a stretcher just showing kind of what patients are expected. It uses sound waves. They have to have jelly. You'll notice that they use jelly and you're kind of sticky. What that does is create um, a seal from the probe to your skin so there's no air and they're able to get images. To me, it looks like a grainy TV. It looks like you need to tune stuff in, but there are ways they can see it. For ultrasound, they're often used to look at babies, which most people like. They might look at your gallbladder with an ultrasound. They can look at your kidneys. They can look at your thyroid. There's so many things they can use it. But in the cancer community, they often use ultrasound as a supplemental to an abnormal mammogram. Or if you're a younger patient, they might have done an ultrasound so they could get more dedicated images. If you've had a breast biopsy and they didn't feel like they could do it under MAMO or under MRI, they might have done your breast biopsy using ultrasound because they were able to locate the mass, do the biopsy, and send it for testing. Hey, I don't know about you. That stuff, the issue is not that it's sticky. It's that it's always really cold. <laughs> <laughs> There's, they can heat it, but I think because they're moving so fast, it doesn't stay. You know what I mean? Um, yes. it, it, ultrasound can also be used for therapeutic uses as well. Not sure if you've ever been to physical therapy or any kind of pain management. They can also use that to rub like on your plantar fascia, which is the thing on your feet or other body parts, they might use the ultrasound to try to send waves in there and help like your tissue get a little more blood flow and heal quicker. Okay, next slide. On to MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. There's generally signage everywhere. If you have an implant, please tell somebody the magnet is always on. What it means is the moment you cross the threshold into the room, it is a magnetic field. So nothing metals in there. If you see metal in there, it's a special kind of metal. And that's why um, they have the signage in there. Everybody screened. They want to make sure that you're okay. When I started in this field 25 years ago, we didn't even scan patients that had pacemakers or who had brain aneurysm surgery. We now scan those. We used to not scan heart stents for six to eight weeks. You can go to the cardiac cath lab, and if you have an issue, they can will you from the cath lab as long as you're on an MRI safe stretcher, and we can put you on the MRI scanner and scan you immediately after implementation. For MRI, they're going to make you remove your clothing. They don't want you to have any metal on. They're going to also ask you to remove any kind of things that wick sweat, like all the wicking clothing, the copper clothing. They can cause issues where we can't image. If you are having an MRI, they're going to also ask that pregnancy question to make sure that they don't put your baby in there if it doesn't need to be or if they're going to give you um, contrast. There oftentimes we scan pregnant women if they're not sure if they have a ruptured appendix or if their placenta is in the wrong place, we can scan them prior to a C-section. So there are times we scan those women, but it depends on what type of exam it is. And if the information of the exam is going to bring you greater good than it might do harm. So for MRI, again, they're going to do the metal screening. They're going to ask you those metal questions when they call to schedule you. Somebody's going to come out and get you from the waiting room and they're going to ask you. 
then the next person might come in there and they're going to ask you again. They're going to check you multiple times because oftentimes we forget about simple little implants. I cannot tell you how many patients over the years have said, nope, I have nothing. Then I'm like, don't you have hearing aids? They have hearing aids, but they forget because they wear them every day. So they're going to make sure for MRI. It's oftentimes patients are claustrophobic in the MRI environment. So they might give you medication to help you lay. MRI is one of the more lengthy exams. Uh, an MRI can be as short as 10 and 15 minutes all the way up to an hour, an hour and a half if they have to do multiple body parts. For MRI, we use specific cameras. You can go to the next slide. Each body part has its own little camera. Some cameras can be used for multiple body parts, but I couldn't scan your foot and scan your head at the same time. It wouldn't work. It's the way we image. For MRI, when they're imaging you, they image you in all different directions. It's called the planes of the MRI. And so we image you. It allows us to look at anything, like we can look at blood vessels if we have it weighted the pr appropriate way, um, which is a type of technique, or we can look at bones, masses, joints. MRI, we don't often use MRI to look at the lungs just because it's a lot of air there and you need to have a water in the tissue for us to be able to get good images. And all tissue has some amount of water in it. So we use the hydrogen atoms. It is noisy because what happens when you lay in the MRI machine, all the hydrogen is trying to align with the magnetic field. And what they do, there's these things called gradients. They're turning on and off to move those atoms around so we can collect the data. For most MRI exams, you're going to lay on your back and then you're going to be positioned in a coil. If you're laying for a breast MRI, you're going to lay on your stomach and each breast is going to fit into this hole in what they call the coil. For you guys, it would be called a camera. So that you put your breast there, it allows them to lay naturally so they hang. And that way, when they're doing the exam, the contrast goes up your arm and through like your blood vessels and it's called a wash in and wash out curve. They scan you timed and they watch the contrast go into the breast and then come back out through the underarms. It just allows them to get a better picture. When you get a breast MRI, you can have anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 images. It depends on your radiology preference. Again, MRI uses like a weighty array, a power of magnet, and um, it looks at all different various parts of the body. There is no radiation involved in MRI. The prep for MRI, again, is going to be pregnancy. They might do blood work if you're getting contrast. They're going to have you change to no metal. You can have oral like MRIs that have contrast, but generally if you're having something like that, you would have digestive disease, and those aren't often done. They do a lot of M uh, liver MRIs. And part of your screening when you first got your workup for your cancer diagnosis, they might have done like a CAT scan and a bone scan and then did a brain MRI because MRI is going to give you the most dedicated images for your brain. Okay, next slide. Oh, before we get done, you can go to the next slide. If you are having an MRI and you are extremely claustrophobic, your technologist should always give you a call bell. You should test that call bell if you go in there. You let them know that they should speak to you. It, there are guidelines out there from the American College of Radiology. They tell radiology how to work, that we should be talking to MRI patients every so many minutes. If you want to sleep, tell your technologist, don't bother me, I want to sleep. But you should have a call bell where you feel safe and you can reach your technologist because they can't not necessarily hear you screaming when the machine is taking the images and it's noisy. You should also always have hearing protection, which should either be in the form of earplugs or headphones that are specifically made for that machine to make sure that your hearing is protected. And for MRI, they generally do most of the exam without contrast, and then they'll inject you at the end, except sometimes in breast MRI, they'll do like one set of images, then inject you, and then do the majority of the exam after. Okay, this last slide says you pose and we expose. And you can go to the next slide. Sorry, sir, we don't have the facilities for a CAT scan, but it's got a bunch of dogs laying on the CAT scan and it says we can surely get you a lab report. So I want to tell you, we are often asked, do you know what's on my images? Can you tell me what's going on? Legally, a technologist should not be giving you any information. So please don't ask them. Do they know? 
if they are a decent technologist and they've been doing this for a while, they absolutely probably know what's going on on your images. They might have even added images. They might have even added certain types of reformats because they know the doctor's going to call and ask for it later. With that being said, your exam should be read within a certain amount of time, not weeks later. Once your exam is read, the results have to be made immediately available to you. That is a law. That is not in just certain states, so there should be a way. Most places have my chart, and you can access them on my chart. They should not be allowed to hold your results on my chart. Oftentimes in our facility, we finish the exam before we get the patient back to their room. They're already looking at their my chart, and then they're calling the physician, asking why they haven't come and told them what the results are. So it can happen. Um, for each modality, there are these things called protocols. You follow a protocol and it's to the radiologist. They, The guy that reads the bones, he wants things done a certain way. So if you go in and there's something looking for the bones, they do stuff for a bone protocol, like for looking at bones. If it's something that has a little mixture of both, then we do like protocols that are combined. If you ever get called back for imaging, it means they ran the standard protocol, but the doctors want more detailed images or they might need to give you contrast because your exam was ordered without contrast. Again, I want to repeat, there are dedicated radiologists for each modality. Lastly, what I want to leave you with, oftentimes I hear patients freaking out because the measurements from one scan to the next is a little different. If I read your test, my eyes are going to see a little different than Abigail's eyes, which means if you have a little difference in the measurement, it's probably because one doctor read it one time and the next doctor didn't. If you have gross things that weren't seen, this is where you can go and you can call the manager or you can call like the patient liaison and ask them, can they have somebody do what is called an addendum? That just means they're going to get somebody that's ahead of the practice to overread and give you a better study. If your gut tells you that something's off, listen to your gut. You need to know your body because as technologists and physicians, they don't know. Also, the information that you give to your technologist about your symptoms or your medical history, that's what's going to help your doctors know to look in specific areas if you're having pain. Because when they're looking at three to 5,000 images and hundreds of cases a day, I would say it's probably easy to be missed. They don't try to do things and there are overreads. But if you have questions or concerns, please make sure that you reach back out. And again, remember, this talk tonight is based off of our experiences and our knowledge of what we've gone through in the radiology department. If you have specific questions for your facility, please make sure you reach out to the facility manager or back to your medical team. And always advocate for yourself. Thank you, Amy, for all of that. I know a lot of the questions in the chat um, were all, all around this idea of how often do I get scans? I'm concerned about this scan versus that scan. And so while I certainly hope this has been helpful as Amy has given you a broad overview, it's super important for you as a patient to be asking your doctor why this scan and not that scan. Unfortunately, the reasoning may come down to protocols. Amy talked about that. The reasoning may come down to what your insurance will cover. It may come down to a variety of other things, right? They want to look at something very specific. And so asking your doctor those questions as you prepare for scans, these are very important things to ask your doctor. Uh, we will also have available shortly a handout um, for you, any of you to download and you can rewatch this presentation and fill it out. Um, but it has the pictures of each of the different uh, machines and different modalities and a place for you to take notes. Uh, so would highly encourage you to uh, look for that when it's available. I think it's going to be going on the website from what I recall. Um, so Amy, as we are wrapping up here, um, I always ask this question of everybody who comes on here is the word that would exemplify our discussion tonight. Um, and I always call on Laura so that people don't feel, you know, on the spot, but I know I can put you on the spot, Amy. So what's your word? I, for today? I would say empowered because I hope that I shared information that will let somebody else feel empowered because you have a voice. You don't have to just do the test because you were told to. So empowered. Great. I love that. How about you, Laura? What came to mind? I think options. 
so many great options out there for, and I love how you framed it, Amy, with like figuring out what, what it is that we're trying to measure, um, you know, or depending on where the metastasis is, and then finding the right radiologist, oncologist to do those types of screenings. And it was just really reassuring that there is so many options out there based on the detection. So very, very yeah. informative. Thank you, Laura. I would say my word for nine is education. Uh, the more educated you are as a patient, the better questions you can ask. Um, probably the more comfortable you'll be with various things that happen. Sometimes it goes the other way. You know it's supposed to happen a certain way, and then you know when it's not. But gathering information, gathering education, talking with other people in this experience can be a way to take back a measure of control over our lives. Uh, because being a forever patient means, to a certain extent, we give up a variety of things, a lot of things, um, in order to be good patients, right? In order to show up at the appointments where we need to go and do all the things that our doctors are asking us to do. But the more we're empowered with education, the more that we can ask good questions and be a good partner with our team, the better the outcomes can be. Uh, so we just encourage you all to check out the links. Um, Laura is posting them in the comments. Um, as well as signing up for our weekly newsletter. Uh, lots of wonderful things happening over at survivingbreastcancer.org. I did want to shout out that Amy is one of our MBC leadership team committee members and um, has done so much for the entire community. And Amy, thank you so much again for being willing to show up at all the things that I book you for <laughs> with a smile on your face. So that's good. <laughs> thank you. And just remember, um, if you're out there listening or watching, make sure that you ask the questions, make them make you feel comfortable. That's why they're there. And if they can't ask for somebody else. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Amy. You, All right, Laura, over to you. Any Anything fun on the uh, SBC horizon you wanted to talk about? Gosh, we are gearing up for the Living Beyond Breast Cancer Metastatic Conference happening um, the weekend of April 19th and 20th. So survivingbreastcancer.org will be there. And we are just looking forward to kind of doubling down on all the resources for our metastatic community. So support groups, podcasts, uh, blogs, content, webinars like this series. So if you have an idea, you can always reach out to us. Um, Abigail at survivingbreastcancer.org or Laura at survivingbreastcancer.org. And I always say, if there's a need, we will go out and build it. So thank you. Thanks for being part of uh, tonight's webinar.